Welcome to NTD News. I'm Kevin Hogan. Here are today's top stories. Republican leaders in Congress say President Joe Biden took some wrong steps on day one. They say he's not putting Americans first. Democrat lawmakers ask the new majority leader to get rid of the filibuster rule. It allows the minority party, which is now Republican, to block legislation with fewer votes. We take a closer look at Biden's recent moves on immigration reform and how an immigration policy expert says Biden's policies could play out. Top Republican lawmakers want to take a hardline approach on China. They're calling on Biden's administration to respond to Beijing sanctions. Donald Trump's top advisor reveals some possibilities of the former president's plans for the future. One of the first involves the 2022 elections. Just in, the Senate has confirmed President Joe Biden's nominee for Secretary of Defense, retired Army General Lloyd Austin. The vote was an overwhelming 90 to 2 in the 100 member chamber, far more than the simple majority needed. He's the first black American to take up the post. In other news, Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell says President Joe Biden's administration took steps in the wrong direction on his first day in office. Senator Mitch McConnell weighed in on the Paris Climate Agreement, the Keystone XL pipeline, and more. On the Biden administration's very first day, it took several big steps in the wrong direction. McConnell speaking for the first time as Senate Minority Leader since the new Congress took over. He says the U.S. was already lowering its carbon emissions outside of the Paris Accord, while other nations like China keep raising theirs even though they're in the agreement. Rejoining will just set us up to kill American jobs while our competitors continue to roar on by. McConnell also criticized the decision to cancel the 1,100-mile oil pipeline from Canada to Nebraska. He said besides thousands of job losses, it will reverse some of the progress towards energy security. McConnell said this was not the day one that American workers deserved. House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy suggested Biden isn't putting Americans first. I was disappointed to see within hours of assuming office the new administration was more interested in helping illegal immigrants than helping our own citizens. He's talking about the proposal to give amnesty to illegal immigrants. And more interested in appeasing the WHO than getting to the bottom of how China released this virus to the world in the first place. He said just this week the World Health Organization admitted its own failure to act quickly at the start of the pandemic, and Biden is rewarding that failure by rejoining the agency. McCarthy says the focus needs to be on America and Americans right now, to get businesses open, kids back in school, and vaccines to everyone that wants one. He said that is a unity agenda. He questioned why Democrats are canceling a scheduled work week next week when there are pressing matters like these. A reporter asked McCarthy his view on whether members of Congress should face prosecution for taking part in the riot at the Capitol on January 6th. He agrees they should. When asked whether he believed former President Trump provoked violence at the Capitol, McCarthy said, if you listened to what he said at the rally, he did not. Top virus expert Dr. Fauci said Biden's administration is not starting to distribute vaccines from scratch. This contradicts a CNN report that claimed Trump officials did not give Biden's team a plan. CNN's White House correspondent cited unnamed Biden officials who claimed, quote, there is nothing for us to rework. We are going to have to build everything from scratch. But during an appearance in the White House briefing room yesterday, Fauci told reporters, we certainly are not starting from scratch because there is activity going on in the distribution. This indicates Biden's officials will build on and adjust the blueprint the Trump administration left them. Fauci praised President Biden's plans for pharmacy buy-in, vaccine centers, and the use of the Defense Production Act to manufacture vaccines, tests, and PPE. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki faced a moment in the hot seat on Wednesday. Reporters asked her why President Biden and his family were spotted without masks on federal property after he signed a mandate requiring it. When questioned about the apparent contrast, the newly appointed press secretary brushed off Biden's actions as celebration. He was inaugurated as president of the United States. He was surrounded by his family. We take a number of precautions, but I don't think, I think we have big, bigger issues to, to worry about at this moment in time. One reporter pointed out Biden often talks about leading by the power of example and questioned whether Biden's actions marked a good example for those who may not pay attention normally. 
But I think uh, the power of his example is also uh, the message he sends by si signing 25 executive orders, including um, almost half of them related to COVID, uh, the requirements that we're all under every single day here to ensure we're sending that message to the public. Biden addressed the public at the Lincoln Memorial on Wednesday. Members of his family were with him, though none wore masks. The event was held just hours after he signed a new executive action requiring masks to be worn on all federal property. It also mandates interstate travelers to use face coverings. Among other mandates, Biden also signed an executive order requiring international air travelers to quarantine after arriving in the U.S. It states that anyone traveling to the U.S. should test negative before departure. It doesn't detail how the policy will be enforced. The order also directs U.S. agencies to talk with Canada and Mexico about health protocols for ports of entry. Nearly all non-essential travel at U.S. land borders with Canada and Mexico is suspended through February 21st. The order goes into effect on Tuesday. Reversing Trump's immigration policy appears, appears to be a top priority for President Biden. Immigration reform was among a slew of executive orders Biden signed just hours after taking the oath of office. NTD's Melina Wisecup has more on the details that were released about a new immigration bill aiming, aiming to fast-track a path to citizenship. Among President Biden's executive orders targeting immigration reform is the decision to stop construction on the southern border wall. Reportedly, the Trump administration extended these contracts through 2022, so for at least another year. Um, and uh, it's not clear how much the the contractors have already committed in terms of buying materials and so on. Um, so the government could be on the hook for a lot of money potentially if these contracts are, are broken. Another executive order she says hasn't gotten much attention, suspending deportation for the next 100 days. Still another of Biden's executive orders aims to strengthen the DACA policy. Vaughn called it a merely symbolic move to show his stance on immigration. That's because it didn't change the current DACA policy. A president cannot create protections for this group of people that are permanent. Uh, in other words, he, he, they can't, people with DACA cannot get green cards or permanent legal status on a path to citizenship unless Congress passes a bill to authorize that. And that explains why New Jersey Senator Robert Menendez is set to introduce a bill to restore an Obama program to let children apply for asylum in the United States. It would allow young immigrants known as Dreamers to get green cards immediately and be eligible for citizenship within three years. Other illegal immigrants living in the states since January 1st would get green cards in five years and be eligible for citizenship within eight. It also would eliminate the waiting list and allow everyone who has uh, currently applied for a green card to enter immediately. Years ago, Congress enacted a waiting list so that we could regulate the level of immigration and keep it at about, well, now it's at about a million people a year and has been for quite some time. This would allow potentially as many as six million people to come as new immigrants within a very short time, as quickly as the government could get them processed. The bill would need 60 votes in the Senate to pass. Vaughn says it's important to have immigration regulation. That's because a huge influx of immigration all at once would cause a budget strain on state and local governments. From their current studies, they found that two-thirds of all legal immigrants are using some form of welfare program. With these questions on the table, she says she doesn't think the new bill will be signed into law. Some Republican lawmakers have already spoken out against it, calling it a poor choice of priorities. Melina Weiskopf, NTD News. And just in, a Texas attorney, Ken Paxton, is filing a lawsuit to block Biden's executive order that freezes deportation. The attorney calls it an unlawful act. Texas's governor supports the suit. Newly elected Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene announces articles of impeachment against the President Joe Biden. They come just one day after his inauguration. Greene's office says the reasons for the impeachment concern Biden's allegedly shady deals in Ukraine and allowing his son to siphon off cash from Russia and China. Greene's office released the statement just a day after Biden was sworn in as the 46th U.S. president. 
The move comes less than a month into the Georgia Republican Congresswoman's first term. Green claimed in the statement that President Biden will do anything to excuse his son's corrupt actions and line his family's pockets with foreign cash. She also mentioned a tape showing Biden admitting to a quid pro quo deal with the Ukrainian government. Some Democrat lawmakers want to get rid of the filibuster rule, which protects the Senate from being controlled by the majority party. More and more Democrats in Congress want new Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer to reject Senator Mitch McConnell's request to keep the Senate filibuster rule. Democrat Ed Markey says it could help them deal with the multiple crises they face. And we have to be able to respond, uh, and the Senate rules have to be used in a way that is, that is uh, consistent with uh, dealing with those incredible uh, problems that we have right now. And that means all options have to be on the table, including uh, eliminating the filibuster. The Senate is now evenly split 50-50. And with Kamala Harris as vice president, the majority goes to Democrats. The filibuster allows the Senate minority to block legislation with just 41 votes. McConnell argues that 20 years ago, the Senate was also evenly split, and both parties honored the filibuster. I've been heartened to hear my colleague say he wants the same rules from the 2000s to apply today. Because certainly 20 years ago, there was no talk, none whatsoever, of tearing down long-standing minority rights on legislation. Republican Marco Rubio pointed out that back in 2005, then-Senator Joe Biden defended the filibuster. Biden said, The very reason we have the filibuster rule is so when one party, when one interest controls all the levers of government, one man or woman can stand on the floor of the Senate and resist, if need be, the passions of the moment. McConnell also said that less than four years ago, 27 current Democrat senators signed a letter insisting on keeping the filibuster rule when they were the minority. Thousands of National Guardsmen at the U.S. Capitol returned to adequate living quarters after being put out in the cold by Capitol Police. The Guardsmen were sleeping and resting in various places around the U.S. Capitol, including in congressional office facilities and the Capitol Visitor Center. The removal order meant retreating into nearby cold, unheated parking garages and other places outside whenever guardsmen took breaks from their 12-hour shifts. Many faced the cold in facilities without adequate heat, electrical outlets, internet reception or bathrooms. Several members of Congress committed to help after an article by Politico exposed the situation, but the U.S. Capitol Police who ordered the removal are under the direct control of congressional leaders. Top Republican lawmakers are calling on the Biden administration to take forceful measures against the Chinese regime. It's in response to retaliatory sanctions Beijing placed on U.S. officials. Republican lawmakers are calling on the new administration to respond to Beijing's latest sanctions. The ongoing chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Jim Risch, took to Twitter. He wrote, By sanctioning 28 outgoing national security officials, the CCP is already testing the Biden administration's resolve to continue a tougher, competitive approach towards China. The leading Republican on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Representative Michael McCall, on Twitter called the sanctions a brazen and baseless attempt to silence and intimidate officials that hold the CCP accountable for genocide and its takeover of Hong Kong. Beijing placed sanctions on former Trump administration officials within minutes of former Vice President Joe Biden being sworn in as president. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson accused the U.S. officials of carrying out a series of crazy moves that undermined China's interests. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is included in the sanctions. Among other former members of the Trump administration now sanctioned are Trade Advisor Peter Navarro, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, Health Secretary Alex Azar, and Deputy National Security Advisor Matthew Pottinger. So far, the spokesperson for Biden's National Security Council, Emily Horn, has said the sanctions are unproductive and cynical. A New York judge ruled that a lawsuit seeking to dissolve the National Rifle Association can go ahead. The judge denied the NRA's efforts to stop it. Manhattan Supreme Court Justice Joel Cohen made no allowance for the NRA's motions to dismiss the case, pause it, or transfer it to another court. Several news outlets reported Cohen saying he will try to keep the case within the state court and under New York jurisdiction and not let it move to federal court. Last week, the NRA declared bankruptcy and said it would move its headquarters from New York to Texas. 
New York Attorney General Letitia James says the move was an attempt to dodge her lawsuit. The NRA says the lawsuit is motivated by political hostility. Two days after leaving the White House, former President Trump can now rest up in Florida. But what are his plans for the future? One of his top advisors revealed some potential plans. Top Trump advisor Jason Miller tells Just the News that former President Trump has a number of goals in the next couple of years. One of his major goals is to win back the Senate and the House for Republicans in the 2022 midterm elections. This is to stop what he calls, quote, the Democratic craziness. The Democratic Party currently holds a majority in both the House and the Senate. Miller also reveals Trump plans to be the nation's leader on voter integrity. He expects Trump to work closely with state legislatures to ensure election integrity. Miller adds that Trump will start after undergoing a transition period first. But because Democrats are in control of both Congress and the White House, Miller does not believe Washington will address the issue of election integrity. Although Trump has not said whether he will run for president again in 2024, he told his supporters before leaving office on Wednesday that, quote, we will be back in some form. He also said in his farewell video on Tuesday that, quote, the movement we started is only just beginning. On the same day, Miller tweeted a picture of the White House with the caption that says, until 2025. Lawyer Butch Bowers is named as lead attorney in former President Trump's Senate impeachment trial. The Senate alleges Trump incited insurrection. Bowers is a graduate of Tulane University's law school and owns Bowers Law Office. According to his website, he represented former Republican governors in North and South Carolina and served in the Justice Department under President George W. Bush. In 2012, Bowers represented then-Governor Nikki Haley over allegations that she engaged in illegal lobbying. Haley was cleared of wrongdoing. The House voted on January 13th to impeach Trump for a second time during his tenure. Lawmakers blame him for the January 6th breach of the U.S. Capitol. This despite Trump urging his supporters to act peacefully ahead of the protests and condemning the violence multiple times following the incident. Many people are flocking to Tennessee. The state became number one U-Haul's immigration, U-Haul's migration growth ranking in 2020. And Florida, Tex- and Florida, with Florida and Texas following close behind, NTD's Don Tran talked to some experts about why people are favoring states in the southeast. Americans moving to Tennessee in droves. According to U-Haul's numbers, the volunteer state had the highest net gain of one-way U-Haul trucks entering a state in a calendar year. This speaks to a larger trend. More and more people have been moving to southern states like Florida and Texas. President of the Pyramid Real Estate Group Peter Gray said it's because southern states are less expensive to live in. There's a very low cost of living in Tennessee. It's 14 percent lower than the national average. Uh, also, Tennessee is um, it's retirement friendly. Uh, there's no uh, income tax on Social Security or retirement uh, account income. Uh, Also, the real estate uh, tax um, is particularly low in Tennessee, and that's caused uh, an influx of retirees into the state. Southern states are appealing in other ways as well. John Boyd, the CEO of a corporate site selection company, said there's more freedom and flexibility. These are states that offer uh, lifestyle amenities that people find attractive, like open spaces and proximity to different nightlife activities. And there are also states that, by and large, avoided the types of draconian lockdowns that we're seeing in New York and in California. The growing number of residents also attracts companies. For example, Alliance Bernstein opened a new office in Nashville, while Volkswagen expanded in East Tennessee. All parts of the state are attracting a new industry. There's a lot of exciting new development activity. It's high in migration really has improved the state intellectual capital, the talent assets, and, you know, the the state economic development officials can really market Tennessee really as a premier labor market. But this rush to the South could be bad news from a real estate standpoint, as prices of homes in southern states have been going up. And one of the results in that is there's a tremendous decrease in the affordability, uh, which ultimately, you know, after in the case of, uh, you know, Texas, I think we're starting to see that, although I'm not sure if it's that or it's COVID, but ultimately that will uh, slow growth and limit the potential. But the increase in housing developments will increase wages for blue-collar workers like plumbers and construction workers. 
Some experts warn southern states that they shouldn't raise taxes and implement failed business policies. Don Tran, NTD News. Still to come, New York City struggles with vaccine delays. It missed over 20,000 appointments this week alone. California faces a drug overdose crisis. The number of homeless residents dying from drug overdoses increases by about a third. Find out more after this short break. Someone has to find a way to build the Great Dome. Completely new, completely original. Mission, A federal court just blocked an Obamacare mandate that forced Catholic doctors to perform gender reassignment surgeries. NTD's Christina Kim has those details. District Court Chief Judge Peter Welty from North Dakota wrote the decision that protects some doctors from being penalized if they refuse to perform gender transition procedures on grounds of religious beliefs. In 2016, the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, issued a rule interpreting a section from Obamacare which prohibits certain forms of discrimination in health care, including sex discrimination. The new rule meant that insurers or third-party administrators couldn't exclude gender transition elements in their plans. This also meant health care providers were not allowed to refuse medical services for gender transitioning if they offered comparable services to others. An order of Catholic nuns, a Catholic university, and Catholic healthcare organizations challenged the mandate. Now, HHS and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission can't enforce the Obamacare mandate. Judge Welty said the Catholic healthcare entity's refusal to perform or cover gender transition procedure is predicated on an exercise of their religious beliefs protected by the First Amendment. During his campaign, Biden vowed to cover care for LGBTQ Americans, including care to cover transitioning and surgery. Javier Becerra, who has been tapped by Biden to lead the HHS, previously argued in favor of using taxpayers' money to provide transgender individuals in North Carolina with coverage for gender transitioning surgery and treatment. Christina Kim, NTD News. Protests erupted across the West Coast after President Biden's inauguration ceremony. Though FBI warnings were previously about far-right violence, the damage and unrest came solely from the far left. Antifa marched through the streets in protest of President Biden's inauguration. In Portland, Oregon, the group held signs reading, We are not governable. They smashed the windows and glass doors of the Democratic Party of Oregon office. Profanity and anarchy symbols were found sprayed on the building. Some smashed windows and vandalized the building. Officers made selective arrests. Eight adults were arrested related to that event. Charges ranged from felony criminal mischief, possession of a destructive device, and riot. During Portland police event, listed an array of weapons seized from Antifa rioters, including Molotov cocktails, fireworks, knives, and pepperball guns. Antifa also marched on the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Building, better known as ICE. Police confronted the group of roughly 150 Antifa rioters there. Police confirmed with NTD that 15 people were arrested in Portland on charges that include rioting and reckless burning. In Seattle, Washington, Antifa marched on the iconic Pike Place Market. They left behind smashed windows at both retail stores and a federal courthouse. Walls were similarly vandalized with spray paint anarchy signs. Police said two arrests were made for the destruction. Local news stations KOMO said a third arrest was made related to breaking glass at the original Starbucks location. In California, roughly 60 similarly dressed and equipped Antifa marched around the Capitol, according to the Sacramento Bee. No damage was reported. Police cited only a fence being knocked over. Reporting by NTD News, Seattle, Washington. 
Senator Chuck Grassley is urging President Biden to denounce the riots, tweeting he's waiting for Biden to condemn the violence, looting, and arson from the last two days in Oregon and Washington state. Neither Biden nor Harris have commented on the incidents. Vaccine centers in New York City are closing, and appointments are getting postponed. That's leaving some New Yorkers in a state of frustration. Here are the details. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio confirms the city has failed to follow through on 23,000 vaccines this week alone. Residents are fed up. My appointment has been canceled. They told me to come back in a week and check online to see if they had any. I don't even know why they even tell us to do that. An elderly person has to deal with this? There's no vaccine. New York City has struggled to deliver the vaccine, but local officials blame the federal government. Uh, we face a supply crisis right now in New York City. We are receiving about 100,000 doses every week in a city where 2.5 million people are eligible, and that even that low number has been unstable and unreliable. President Joe Biden moved to coronate a federal effort to fight the pandemic on his first full day in office. He took steps to expand testing and vaccinations and mandated mask wearing on federal property. He also asked all Americans to wear masks for the first 100 days he's in office to stop the spread of the virus. As of Thursday morning, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention said it had administered over 17 million doses of the vaccine out of some 38 million distributed. The pandemic has killed 405,000 people and infected more than 24 million in the United States. The drug overdose crisis is making things worse for the homeless in Los Angeles. It has claimed many lives, and that's on top of the losses due to the pandemic. A report shows the number of homeless who died of overdose increased by a third over the year. NTD's reporter Zach Lee has more. According to the latest report from the Los Angeles County Public Health Department, there is an alarming increase in overdose deaths in the homeless population for the first seven months of 2020. 273 homeless people died of overdose, which is a 33% increase over the same period of time last year. Soledad Ursua is a resident from Venice Beach. She said her town has the second largest homeless population in Los Angeles County, which is experiencing rampant drug dealing. Uh, we're seeing drug dealers coming in because they dominate the market and it's a supply and demand issue. They prey on the homeless. We've also seen that the drug dealers are using tents because it's a great way to operate without you know, the police being able to see you. So there is a big criminal element that is using the homelessness to hide under. The county's report shows that the increase in overdose deaths are driven by a more frequent use of fentanyl. Scott Silverman, an expert on drug addiction, said that China was once one of the largest manufacturers of fentanyl on the planet. He said that it is very easy to buy the materials online through the black market. And we can manufacture it in our garage. The $5,000 investment can buy you the supplies you need to create millions of dollars with the sales of fentanyl because a tiny milligram, the size of a pin point, not a pin head, is enough to kill somebody. But the homeless are not the only victims. Silverman said that under the stay-at-home order, many people are experiencing depression and anxiousness, which could lead them to self-medication. He believes a lot of deaths are related to accidental overdoses. And what happens is when they take that pill, that pill could be cut with fentanyl and mix that with alcohol, and you have a very dangerous combination that's going into the body. And I think that's one of the things that's really increasing the overdose. In San Francisco, almost four times as many people have died from drug overdoses compared to the CCP virus. The Associated Press reported that 621 people died from drug use, while 173 have died from the virus in the city last year. Reporting by Zach Lee, NTD News, Los Angeles. And just ahead, three Chinese companies asked the New York Stock Exchange to reconsider delisting them in the wake of former President Trump's executive order. That and more after the break. It's just clear as day. The media, whether it's broadcast cable or print media, has become extremely biased. And I started looking online for alternative ways to, to get information. And I saw an ad for a free trial. And I looked at it and I said, Epoch Times. I mean, come on, this is end of days type of stuff. I mean, what are they gonna be talking about here? And I said, well, it's a free trial, let me dig in. 
Is it giving me both sides? Is it giving me an objective point of view here? I have looked for opportunities to see where they might be biased, and I don't find it. It has given me a level of trust in media that I didn't think I'd ever get back. I love the Epoch Times because it has renewed uh, my faith in the idea that a reliable, responsible, non-biased source of information is available. And I can say that I love it because of that. Shanghai is imposing lockdowns on two of China's best-known hospitals after they were linked to new CCP virus cases. Outpatient services have been suspended at Fudan University Shanghai Cancer Center and Renji Hospital, both of which have been cordoned off along with some surrounding residential communities. China now finds itself on guard against new clusters of CCP virus infections that have been emerging largely in the country's frigid north. Lockdowns have been imposed in parts of Beijing and other cities following outbreaks. Schools are letting out early, and citizens have been told to stay home for next month's Lunar New Year holiday. The virus situation in China's capital is getting more severe. Authorities are ramping up virus prevention me measures. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on what's happening in China. Now we take a look at the CCP virus pandemic in China's capital. Over 1.6 million residents are barred from leaving Beijing right now. The restriction targets a district in Beijing called Daxing. This comes after new CCP virus cases emerged in the area. Beijing is a city of 21 million. Daxing district is now under strict lockdown. A nearby subway station is shut down. All businesses are closed and residents are undergoing mass nucleic acid tests. And Beijing authorities have extended the quarantine period. People arriving in Beijing from overseas now have to be quarantined for at least 20 days. Over 300,000 migrant workers are also barred from entering Beijing. They are stranded in a small town just outside the city and are blocked from entering the capital city as the outbreak worsens in their locality. Three Chinese firms want the New York Stock Exchange to reconsider its decision to delist them. That comes after it delisted the companies earlier this month. The three firms are China Mobile, China Telecom, and China Unicom Hong Kong. The companies asked the exchange to review its decision. The NYSE was following an order by President Trump. It bars Americans from investing in companies Washington says have ties to the Chinese military. It's triggered a wide fallout, with U.S. investors quickly selling off stakes and index providers cutting them from their benchmarks. So far, nearly $6 billion has been wiped out from these companies' Hong Kong traded shares. And up next, another lawsuit is filed against California's governor. Bay Area restaurants are suing him for banning in-person dining. Find out more when we come back. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslane and perillocetes, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7 and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritang Omega-3 does not smell fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritang Green Vegetable Omega-3. Eat two a day and you'll feel brand new! California's Governor Gavin Newsom faces another lawsuit. Bay Area restaurants are suing him for unfair outdoor dining regulations. Here's NTD's Eileen Eng with the story. Bay Area restaurants and wineries are suing Governor Gavin Newsom and the California State Public Health Officer Tomas Aragon for banning outdoor dining, calling it arbitrary, irrational, and unfair. 
collectively called the Wine Country Coalition for safe reopening, they filed the complaint on Tuesday, January 19th. It states that the plaintiffs have invested millions of dollars adapting to the state's roller coaster of COVID guidance, and that the prohibitions have caused them much harm to the livelihoods of employees and the industry. At a Reopen California Now conference earlier this month, restaurant owners talked about their struggles. We've done temperatures, we've got social distancing, masks, glass, uh, places where people have to stand, you know, they can't come inside. You know, this is getting crazy. This is getting to where I'm going to have to let more people go and close my doors if something doesn't change. We got to stand up. We got to fight. We got to we got to we got to do what's right here. We have to still know that this is real. It's totally real. But we also have to be real about this is going to be economic suicide for us. I'm in a location right now that is completely dark. Um, as you can see here. When business should be booming, uh, we're here on a Thursday afternoon and I've got a restaurant bar that is completely empty and dark. Um, I know we'll be getting through this lockdown. Um, when is the, the question? But, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to get texts every other week asking how we're going to pay our payroll. Um, from my accountant uh, asking how we're going to pay some bills. So uh, it's kind of been draining my savings. I had a mom come in with her 14 year old daughter who told me together that I could share that the daughter had just been released from the hospital with attempted suicide. And the daughter said, I just want to go somewhere where I can feel normal. Right now, we have an opportunity to be that resource, to be that hope for our community. That's why it's so vital that we stay open. The coalition consists of over 50 restaurants, wineries, tasting rooms, and suppliers across Napa and Sonoma counties. There's also support from several members around the Bay Area. Reporting by Eileen Eng, NTD News, Santa Clara, California. Have you ever wanted to own a decommissioned train car? A popular transit system in California's Bay Area is donating its legacy vehicles as it brings in new cars. Our reporter David Lamb brings us more. Bay Area Rapid Transit, also known as BART, has carried passengers in the Bay Area for nearly 50 years. Recently, it plans to donate its decommissioned fleet cars, most of which would be recycled for parts. BART is replacing them with its new Fleet of the Future cars. On January 19th, BART accepted applications for people who want to reuse its legacy cars. Several proposed ideas to give the cars a new life include art purposes, restaurant use, or even homeless shelters. The applicant is responsible for transportation costs. That's estimated to cost 8 to 10 grand per car. Qualification is based on respecting BART's brand and how the car would finally be disposed of once no longer used. As of January 20th, BART ridership is at 42,000 riders which is down 89% from its pre-COVID numbers. BART's first round of deadline is March 12th. It expects to donate the cars to qualified applicants in 2022. David Lamb, NTD News, Santa Clara, California. American Airlines is taking up a creative new business solution for its leftover booze, a wine delivery service. The program is called American Airlines Flagship Sellers. A monthly subscription starts at $99. You get three bottles of wine with that option. American Airlines is also offering single bottles, which range in price from about $13 to $40. Airlines still aren't offering the amount of flights they did before the pandemic, and alcohol is banned in many cabins to help thwart virus spread. That means a lot of leftover booze that American Airlines is looking to cash in on. A new smart mirror is helping gym fans get a professional workout session while limiting human-to-human -human contact amid the pandemic. When it comes to fitness, form is everything. Taiwanese firm Johnson Health Tech's new AtMirror uses a 3D camera to monitor users' workouts and give personalized feedback. Uh, during the COVID-19 period, and a lot of people love to do exercise in home, and because you don't need to go outside, so actually our home use equipment uh, was very, very popular in the market, almost so out everything we have. And this mirror actually can help in a lot of people because when you're doing the exercise, you have a lot of different choice. You can uh, dance cardio, then you can use a yoga. 
Johnson Health Tech CEO Jason Lowe says Atmir helps conform with social distancing regulations. During the COVID-19, and I think most important is you do not want to uh, touch the other people, and you do not want to share the same space with the other people. So this uh, Johnson 8 cycle, you actually can um, use uh, in your private home. And when you use it, you don't need to touch the mirror. You can use the cell phone, right? And so you don't need to really share the same equipment with the other people. Chen Chun Xiu is a baseball player for Taiwanese team Rakut Monkeys. The team works with Johnson Health Tech. He says the mirror is complementary to a real coach when he trains on the baseball field. When you work with a coach on the baseball field, you don't really know how to correctly perform certain moves. So some moves are not correct. But this does not happen with at mirror because you can see your own moves. You're very sure how to perform a move. Admir costs approximately eighteen hundred dollars, and a subscription for various streamed content is priced between fourteen and seventeen dollars. And up next, Twitter is under scrutiny in the UK. Lawmakers there say the platform has a clear double standard. That's because it has banned former U.S. President Donald Trump, but allowed the Chinese embassy's posts on forced labor to remain. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, while simple folks like you and me we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever. Just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of The Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. And now let's go over to Europe. Storm Christoph sweeps through the UK, leaving some regions in northwest England and Wales flooded with hundreds of residents evacuated. Neil Woodrow in our UK newsroom will bring us more from Europe. Hello and welcome. UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson visits a flood-hit area in northwest England to see the impact of Storm Christoph. England has nearly 400 active flood alerts and warnings in place. NTD's Earl Rhodes has more. Running through the area is the River Mersey. Its extremely high water levels are flooding nearby streets and fields. Hundreds of residents were evacuated overnight. Johnson praised the Environment Agency for its work. 10,000 homes in the, in, the, in the Manchester area, in the Disby area, have been protected just as a result of what they've been doing uh, overnight. The Environment Agency's website shows that England has nearly 400 flood warnings or alerts, including three severe warnings. The weather forecast says there's more rain coming next week. So it's vital that people who are in potentially affected areas follow the advice and get the Environment Agency flood alerts uh, where, they, uh, where they can. Videos posted on Twitter show water racing through another town in the area. The BBC reports that 49 residents and staff at a retirement village in that town are stranded by the floods. Wales has over 60 flood warnings and alerts, including two severe warnings. The area near a CCP virus vaccine factory is flooded, but the site is operating as normal. Earl Rhodes, NTD News. The British Embassy in Beijing issues a second article refuting China's six public statements on Hong Kong-related topics, calling them misleading. The UK is providing a bespoke immigration route for eligible British nationals overseas from Hong Kong. China says the Sino-British Joint Declaration provides no right or entitlement for the UK to interfere in Hong Kong after 1997. The British Embassy says the Joint Declaration remains a legally binding international agreement, and China made a legally binding commitment to the UK to ensure the rights and freedoms of the people of Hong Kong. So the UK has the right to hold China to this commitment. 
Twitter is under scrutiny in the UK after permanently deleting former US President Donald Trump's account, but allowing tweets from the Chinese embassy that justify an alleged genocide. Our UK correspondent Jane Werrell has the details. The entire internet into that region. Top Twitter chief Nick Pickles faced tough questions at a Wednesday committee meeting, challenging the platform over its alleged inconsistencies. So on one hand, you have President Trump's account suspended for inciting violence. Fine. But on the other hand, your platform continues to allow a platform to embassies of the Chinese government based all over the world to defend and justify the violence and the genocide which they are carrying out against their own people. Pickles noted the explicit label on accounts run by state media and government. He says removing Twitter accounts to protest against censorship in China doesn't further public conversation. The fact that this conversation is happening in public on Twitter, I think gives us a greater global public conversation to hold governments like the Chinese government to account. Edwards mentioned a retweet from the Chinese embassy in the UK that claims forced labour is the biggest lie of the century, aimed to restrict and suppress the relevant Chinese authorities and companies and contain China's development. Pickle says that particular tweet doesn't violate the company's rules. According to reports, Twitter did lock the account of China's US embassy several days ago. It follows a post defending China's policy toward Uyghurs in Xinjiang, claiming Uyghur women were no longer baby-making machines. Beijing says it was confused by the restrictions. Jane Werrell, NTG News, London. UK's Foreign Office refuses to grant the full diplomatic status and privileges to EU ambassadors after Brexit. According to a BBC report, Britain's refusal is because London doesn't want to set a precedent for others by treating an international body in the same way as a nation-state. Meanwhile, the EU says it is not a typical international organisation and claims that the UK was supportive of the policy when they were an EU member. EU passes a resolution halting the completion of Nord Stream 2. The undersea gas pipeline from Russia to Germany aims to double capacity upon completion. The resolution was in response to the arrest of Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny, and it has divided the EU. Some EU members say the pipe will undermine Ukraine and increase the EU's energy reliance on Russia. German Chancellor Angela Merkel says she continues to back the project despite Navalny's arrest. The US says it will place sanctions on the constructing ship, which the Kremlin is calling unlawful. In the egg industry, billions of male chicks are culled each year worldwide, but a new bill would end the practice in Germany. Entity's Trevor Piper has the story. About 45 million male chicks are killed each year in Germany after hatching because they don't produce eggs and generate little meat. But by the end of this year, Germany wants to be the first country in the world to ban the practice. Germany is leading the way in animal welfare. France has announced that it will follow us, as have other countries in the EU. Two years ago, a German court ruled the killing as permissible under animal welfare law as long as there was no practical way to find out the sex of an unhatched chick. This is about to change as a government-funded initiative has now found a way through analysing reflected light sent into the egg. That is why it is a good day, on the one hand for animal welfare, but on the other hand also for the breeders that they also have alternatives. The legislation still needs to be approved by Germany's lower house of parliament. Trevor Piper, NTD News. The organisers of this year's London Marathon say 50,000 runners are expected to tackle the course on the city streets, while another 50,000 will compete in a remote race. With a national vaccination drive underway, organisers hope to have 50,000 runners for the traditional race on October 3rd. The virtual marathon allows participants to run on a 26.2-mile course of their choice, but they must complete it on October 3rd. A virtual London marathon was held for the first time last year, after the actual race was cancelled due to the CCP virus pandemic. Nearly 38,000 runners took part to set a Guinness World Record for the most people participating in a remote marathon in 24 hours. That's all for now. Back to New York. And soon we'll take you to a village in Russia with a sanctuary for cows too old to milk. See how they while away their days saved from the slaughterhouse. More on that after the break.
Ski stars from around the world are set to tackle an infamous course in Austria starting January 22nd. A skydive team dropped in on the slopes for a taste of what it feels like to fly down the course. Hurling past trees and barriers, four daredevils executed a world first flight over a legendary downhill course. Having watched races there while growing up in Austria, one of them said that while flying down, he realized how difficult the course really is. The fact that we can fly down the course with the wingsuit just shows how steep the whole thing must be for the skiers, and it must be brutal to ski down there. It's the toughest race in the world for a reason. The skydivers dropped out of a helicopter from over 8,000 feet. The wingsuit pilots flew through steep canyons while the paragliders focused their speed parachutes on the sweeping tracks. Marco said he expected the task to be easier. The trek to fly down with the wingsuit and the high-speed canopy is pretty tricky because there are a lot of obstacles uh, in the trek, in the, in the strife. So we had to focus to fly really clean. The skydivers got to a speed of almost 40 miles per hour in less than one second, reaching speeds of more than 150 miles per hour. In a tiny Russian village, dairy cows that are too old to milk are going to a picturesque retirement home to live out their twilight years. Nestled between the snowy hills in the Republic of Tatarstan is Goshala, one of the oldest and largest cow shelters in the country. This is a retirement home for local dairy cows who can no longer be milked or whose owners no longer need them. People in the area tend to hand cows over as they get older and become more difficult to maintain. Many do not want to slaughter their cattle, so they ask the volunteers to shelter them instead. It's already good that people began to think about how to find a new home for them and not just kill them, not to slaughter, not give to the butcher, but simply to save their life. Around 100 animals now live here, including some young animals born in the refuge. They live satisfied lives with three meals a day and no need to work. The cost of keeping one cow per day is slightly more than two dollars, but it's hard to find the funds. Most of the funds come from donations. Another significant share of income is from the sale of environmentally friendly dairy products. We produce cream, butter, ghee, fat and low-fat cottage cheese. Sometimes we have vegetarian cheese, that is, we make cheese without rennet, gurud, paneer. These are milk sweets, condensed milk. They say here that this is milk from happy cows, and it costs just under $4 per gallon. The products are delivered to the regions through ride-sharing services. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. I'm Kevin Hogan. Hi, we're happy to announce that you can also catch us on cable TV now. Millions of households already choose us as one of their trusted news sources, and you can too. You can watch us in Chicago, Washington, D.C., New York, and many other cities as well. And if your system doesn't carry NTD yet, you can just give them a quick call and request NTD on your cable provider. Thank you for watching. See you next time.